Hey guys, how's it going? Today we are going to install some awesome goodies on the Razor Turbo, 2017 Razor Turbo, aka the Battle Wagon. Um, if you guys have been watching the channel for any length of time, you know all about my, my ride. Uh, you know most of the stuff that's done to it. But today we're doing a mod that I'm really, really excited to do and I've wanted to do for a really long time. We are going to install a full clutch kit with Helix and a re replacement uh, primary cover, which has fan blades on it, um, to move more air through the CVT, which everyone knows is an issue on the 2017 Razor Turbos. Here's the um, upgraded Helix. This is the 1024 Helix. All these parts are from Aftermarket Assassins. Um, arguably, probably one of the top guys in the game. They're right kind of at the top level there, competing for first place when it comes to the, um, the tuning game, when it comes to clutches and um, ECU tunes and stuff like that. Um, so we've got the primary, secondary springs from them that go along with the clutch upgrades that we're doing. We have all the um, wear components, heavy duty wear components to replace. We've got their adjustable weight set with magnetic weights. Um, and then we have their primary clutch puller and a secondary clutch compression tool, as well as a snap ring delete kit, um, the clutch limiter shims, and uh, the hardware that we need to get all this to work. On top of that, we've got two colder spark plugs to go with their awesome DinoJet custom ECU tune. Uh, I went with the Stage 3 tune. It runs on premium pump gas, 91 octane, um, and it's gonna give me about 30 more horsepower and get rid of all the restrictions. It's gonna give me max power and low range. It's gonna give, it, it, it's basically gonna unlock the full potential of the Razor. I've waited a long time to tune the Razor. I wanted to, <laughs> I never wanted to, like, I've got the five year warranty on this machine. Um, I've had the machine for coming on four years now, almost, or give it, yeah, it's around four years now. And um, honestly, the only thing that I've ever had to warranty on this machine in over 5,000 miles is one steering rack that Polaris covered and two rear calipers that Polaris covered. Um, I, I, as far as anything else goes, I haven't had any issues with this machine. I think, I think there was like a, um, there was like a gas, tank vent recall or something so they did something like that on it but besides that this thing has been bulletproof for over 5,000 miles i've beaten on it you guys have seen the videos i'm definitely not the hardest rider out there but i'm far 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 from um from being timid um, the machine's seen a lot of mixed use and it's always held together well it's going to be really awesome to unleash um, some more power and be able to put it down to the ground even better i've been running 32s on stock clutching for a while they've worked well but they have left some room for improvement, obviously. Uh, I, I, and I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm, I'm running the 32 by 10 by 15 System 3 XR 370s, and it's gonna feel awesome attaching those to some wicked, wicked clutches. Because um, at the end of the day, the clutches are what's sending the power you're making to the wheels. Um, so the ECU tune and the clutches go hand in hand. It should work awesome. Aside from that, I've got two new belts. This is the Striker belt from uh, Aftermarket Assassins. It's a G-Boost belt, so I'm sure this thing's gonna hold together well. I got two of them. Um, the belt that's on there right now is tired anyway, so I would had to replace it uh, regardless. So we're gonna start off by installing the, uh, the clutching. We'll do the clutch kit and everything first, and um, then we'll uh, mess around with the DinoJet ECU tune. As the, as the last bit of the puzzle. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, if you haven't checked out Aftermarket Assassins, check them out, they're very knowledgeable. Mike at Aftermarket Assassins really knows his stuff and his customer service is top notch. Dealing with the guys is great. They're swamped, they're so busy. Uh, they're, they're, they're making more sales than they ever have. Uh, you guys know that because of COVID and all this crap, the market, as far as power sports is concerned, is like off the rocker. So they've been swamped there. Um, so with that being said, if you do email them, give them a few days to get back to you, but they will get back to you. Mike is awesome. He'll, he'll give you the information you need. You can ask him questions and he'll make sure he fine tunes the products for your needed application so that, that you can get the results that you're after. Um, these are definitely premium grade parts. Um, this is the higher end of the spectrum. 
when it comes to performance goodies and it's just another case of you get what you pay for. Um, so I'm super stoked. I know right away, I, I know I'm going to be satisfied with this stuff because I know a few guys personally that we ride with, a few of my friends that have run their aftermarket assassin stuff. I know um, a few other channels I watch. My buddy uh, Zach from Dirt Dudes, uh, used to be Michigan Dirt. Him and um, a bunch of the guys he rides with, uh, like Nick, they all run aftermarket assassins goodies. Um, so um, they've had really good results with it. My buddy Razor Dave, um, he's in a bunch of the videos from kind of day one. He's got aftermarket assassin stuff on his machine and it's worked really well. And a, a handful of other guys I've, um, I've ridden with have, uh, some of them have a bunch of aftermarket assassins components, some of them have uh, a few. Um, but I haven't heard any negative about them yet. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, full disclaimer, um, Mike did hook me up with a bit of a deal on these, but I, I, I did pay for these parts. Um, these aren't like freebies or anything like that, so you're gonna get an unbiased review. Um, and yeah, so let's get to it. And you know, I gotta say it, um, make sure you subscribe to the channel, follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. And uh, check out some of our previous do-it-yourself videos or the riding content. If you're new to the channel, then make sure you check out some of the ride videos because, I mean, that's the bread and butter of this channel. But a lot of you guys have been telling me that you do enjoy the kind of behind-the-scenes shop content to show everyone what has to go into maintaining these machines. And, and a lot of you guys like to know the setups of the various machines on the channel. So um, I'm going to try and... I'm gonna try and mix some content like this into the riding videos. So as always, be patient. It does take a lot of time to edit this content, especially the, 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 the extended length ride videos. So uh, just stay with me. I appreciate all the support over the years, guys. Plenty more content coming your way. All right, let's dig in there. Let's get this baby souped up. Oh yeah. So here we have it, all the goodies laid out. We've got the clutch compression tool. We've got the primary clutch puller. We've got the snap ring delete kit or the secondary shim kit. We've got the XP Turbo 64 inch wide clutch setup with the helix and the adjustable weights, as well as all new wear components, the sliders in there. Um, we've got the primary secondary springs. We've got the um, primary clutch fan blade cover with the hardware. We've got the dyno jet tuner with the stage three tune on it, as well as the stage two tune on it. Two colder range NGK spark plugs. We've got the primary clutch limiter um, bushing or washer. And we've also got the Razor Turbo secondary butter shift washer, which um, also makes, it's supposed to improve the shift feel of the machine, as well as the two um, striker belts, all from aftermarket assassins, guys. Only the best. The Razor is gonna run wicked. Super, super pumped about this. This stuff is gonna be a game changer. I, I mean, I've sh I should have done this a long time ago, but you know what's gonna be really cool? I love building machines and stages and really feeling the advantages of adding mods. Um, I've never been that guy that loves, that, that goes out and like puts 50 things on their machine. I'm more rather go out and you know slap a couple bolt-ons on drive it slap another few on drive it change something up drive it and then you really get a feel for for the impacts that certain modifications have on your machine and they don't all just mold and like kind of melt into one um that's just the way i do it i mean hey man if i won the lottery and i was building a, a crazy uh, a, kind of like a, a project razor then yeah you know what if you can pull it off and you can do everything at once hell yeah do it um, but to the average Joe, which I am, I mean, um, sometimes you can't go out and buy everything at once. Uh, so it's a lot of fun just kind of putting every, putting a new piece on every, every, every other week or something and seeing what it does to your machine out on the rides. Uh, and sometimes it, it, sometimes things take away. So, you know, you, you, you change stuff, you remove it, you go back to something else, you try something different. And, um, and that's kind of just, that's part of the fun. I mean, building these machines, maintaining them, it, it, you have to kind of enjoy all of it. Sure, riding is the best part of it all, but I don't mind wrenching on the machine. I, I damn well rather ride, but wrenching on these razors, it's pretty easy. Um, they're well thought out, they're easy to work on. Um, I'm guessing not many Can-Am guys are watching this video because they'd be saying so like, oh yeah, they gotta be easy to work on because you gotta work on all the time, razors are crap. <laughs> They all break, they all break. I've seen them all break down on the trail. We've seen plenty of Can-Am products break down. We've seen plenty of Polaris products break down. We've seen Arctic Cats break down. We've seen everything in between fail. They're all machines, they all break. They all have issues and flaws, they all wear out. 
end a conversation. Do some models perform better than others? Are some models more reliable? Yeah, but at the end of the day, it comes down to mostly operator. How well are you using your machine? And how well are you taking care of and maintaining that machine proactively rather than reactively? So my uh, clutches have been making a little bit of noise lately, a little more noisy than usual. Um, I did rebuild them all last year, but I've also put a lot of abuse on them since then. So all this stuff will be awesome. The machine should feel pretty new once this is all done, as well as some of the other supporting mods I'm doing, like the upgraded lighting, some upgraded suspension components. I'm also gonna put a, um, a seal kit on the airbox and on the um, CVT. Um, and we've already got a bunch of other goodies on here. So every time I modify something, I feel like I'm just adding a little bit more performance to the Razor and it's getting better. And I, I'm not done with this platform yet. I've thought about buying a new at machine. I thought about buying a Pro XP Ultimate because it's, it's the baddest beast out there. But at the end of the day, I'm super happy with this machine. And I still got a lot to do to it to um, before I'm before I'm really done with it. And the truth is, on the kind of trail riding we do, the technical stuff, most of it comes down to to operator, not necessarily the fact that you drive a Pro XP Ultimate or whether you drive a Razor Turbo 1000 XP. Um, when you're out on the trail, it, it has a lot to do with the line you pick, the way you approach a hill, and and the driver's skill set and a bit of luck and a bit of luck. Tire choice, all that stuff. It's not always coming down to power in the newest, fanciest machine, but y'all know that. Um, anyways, enough talk. Let's get all these goodies on the machine. We're gonna start this off. We're gonna pull the cover off on the CVT. There's, I think, eight, eight millimeter bolts holding the cover on, and then a hose clamp on here so you can pop that off. I'm gonna pop this whole boot out of the way. Here, you might not have this. I've got an inline blower fan, but after talking to Mike at um, aftermarket assassins he says realistically at higher speeds that blower fan creates more restriction than it adds airflow um, so he says with the, the the primary fan cover he says I probably won't need that um, so he says he's seen mixed results on them but they did some testing and it doesn't actually add any cooling at higher speeds but however it does at lower speeds help bring more air through the CVT so um, I'm gonna try and locate an OEM pipe here or something to put in here and uh, I'm gonna to get rid of the fan, and I'm gonna do some of my own testing down the line because I've got the um, I've got the Razorback Technology infrared belt temperature sensor in here, so it gives me a good idea of my belt temps. So we'll see, we'll, we'll mess around with it. It's fun doing some science and seeing what different mods add. So um, I might actually remove that and then see, um, or I might leave it on, see how it runs, do some testing, remove it, see how it runs, do some testing, and and, and see the differences. So uh, let's get this baby off there and then we can pull the clutches. Undo your uh, CVT bolts here. Undo the uh, hose clamp. Spin that guy out of the way so it's not interfering with anything. Here, you probably won't have this line. I'm gonna do a little video on this. A lot of people have been asking me how I've plumbed my diverter valve or my blow off valve uh, so that it vents the atmosphere but doesn't contaminate itself when I go through water and stuff. So that's some custom piping I made for it. I'll show you that in the upcoming video. So let's pull this cover. Don't lose any of those bolts. So now we have access to the clutches. Um, I do have some modifications done to my clutches already. I've got boondocker super sliders in there. They're like a stainless steel slider. I've got a boondocker um, snap ring delete kit on there and I've also got a boondocker secondary spring in there. But besides that, the rest of the clutches are stock. Um, and right now I'm running a, an Evo Power Sports um, badass belt on there, which my understanding is, is it's also made by G-Boost, um, um, which is the same company that makes the Striker belt. So I'm assuming they're quite similar. They're very, very good belts. All the G-Boost built belts are the best belts you can get, uh, arguably better than OEM. Uh, but it depends who you ask. There's that argument between OEM versus uh, a G-Boost, um, but as far as any other aftermarket belts go, and I've tried absolutely every one of them, I would only ever run a G-Boost belt or a OEM belt. So we're gonna pull this off. Um, we're gonna pull the primary clutch off and we're gonna pull the secondary clutch off. Um, I have a video on the channel on how you can remove a stuck primary. If you have trouble, we're gonna go over this in a minute, but if, if you have trouble removing your primary or if you, you, you're worried you might or you've tried to take it off before and you can't, I've got a cool trick up on the channel about how you can use water or grease to, um, to help you pop these clutches off. Um, so check that out, because when I first took mine off for the first time ever, it was, it was on there so good, it's like it was welded on. 
So um, what we'll do is we'll start off by, um, you, you could start off by, compre by um, getting the belt off using the belt tool, but realistically you don't need to do that because we're just gonna remove the secondary anyways. So the belt will come off once we take the bolt out of the secondary. The secondaries always come off easy. I'm gonna go ahead, grab the tools I need, and we're gonna pop that bolt out. Then we can pop the secondary out and then we can take the belt off and then we can deal with the primary clutch here. I also have a video on the channel um, that goes over how to change a belt in five minutes. Um, so you can see that as well. And um, it'll give you an idea how easy it is to pull the belt off and put a new belt on using the belt tool that comes with the machine that threads into one of these two holes. Okay, so I'm gonna get a 17 mil and I'm gonna hammer this baby off. So now with the secondary loosened off, so it pulls apart nicely. There we go. Two pieces, we'll set that aside on the workbench for now. We're gonna have to take this baby apart and replace the helix in it with the new one they sent us. Whoa, there's a lot of belt debris and stuff in there. Now we can just slip the belt off, the old belt. This belt's pretty worn out, I believe. We'll, we'll take a look at it in a bit and see what kind of damage is on it. There we go. This belt's definitely seen better days. So we'll set that guy aside for now and uh, we'll pull the primary. You can do most of this service um, and the clutch rebuild for the primary, like changing the, the spring and all that without removing the primary. You can just remove this cover put pressure on it and the spring isn't very um, strong in there so you can easily hold it with your hand and you can do most of this maintenance. I'm just going to take it all off. I'm going to put it on the bench. I'm going to inspect every little bit of it and we're going to take a good look at it. We're going to make sure everything behind the cover is good. We're looking here. It doesn't look like I have any seal issues which is really good. Sometimes the seals leak here or there. It's an issue on some razors. Mine looks fine. 5,000 miles it's still good which is a good thing. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to grab the, uh, I'm going to get this bolt out and then we'll put the clutch puller in there and we'll see if we can pop that clutch off real easy or if it's going to be a biatch. Primary bolt is a 21. Pretty easy to get off. Pull that guy out and set him aside. Now we're going to get our clutch puller. Do not use cheap China clutch pullers, guys. The tip can bend and cause damage. It can break inside somewhere and then you're, you don't want to go there. You just don't want to go there. Spend the extra few bucks, get a reputable quality made primary clutch puller like the one from Aftermarket Assassins. Do not go buy those cheap $20 eBay ones because it's going to end up costing you a lot more than $20. You're going to hate yourself if something fails. So please make sure you get a good clutch puller. Okay, so the aftermarket assassins puller uses a 22 mil socket head and then you have to make sure to put some grease on the threads and on the tip of the puller. Okay, so I'm going to put some grease on the threads here to help it go in. And I'm going to grease the end of it here. And now we'll just thread this guy in there. Always start it by hand till you bottom it out and then get ready to hit it with the impact. Don't be shy. You actually need a really strong impact gun for this. This one's not strong enough. I'm gonna use my air impact. These, can, these things can really be on there. Like I said earlier, if you want more info on getting a really stubborn uh, primary off then check out the video I have with like the kind of uh, some secret tricks on how to get it off using grease or water let's see if this guy goes off Things on there, good. Oh. I'm 
gonna put a bit more grease on the tip. It helps make like a hydraulic kind of pressure seal and a lock in there. And sometimes it helps the um, clutch pop off. It creates more pressure. You just gotta wipe this grease out of there later when we're done. Let's hit it again and see. And this clutch, sometimes it just like, it, it blows off when it pops finally. I need a stronger impact gun. I'm gonna let the compressor charge. Okay, I let the compressor charge. Let's see if it'll go now. I put a bunch more grease in there. I'm gonna hit it with a hammer a bit. There we go. Whew, that freaks me out every time. So that's all it took. You just gotta break that seal. Then we'll, um, since I pumped a bunch of grease in there, I'll, um, I'll spray some lube in there, like some WD-40. I'll wipe it out with like a, kind of like a paper towel tampon, and then I'll spray it out maybe with some brake clean or, or some more WD-40 and some compressed air. But for now, the key is we've got our clutch off. So with our primary off now, that's all good. We can unthread the puller, comes right out. And we'll clean the inside of the clutch out there too, get all the grease out. Um, yeah, these can be a pain in the ass. Um, I would say that this one came off really well actually in comparison to some of the other experiences I've had. So now we'll get these clutches wiped down. I'm gonna blow it all out with compressed air because there's a bunch of like belt debris and dust and stuff in there. And then uh, we'll set them up on the table. We'll take the cover off and we'll start digging into it and getting the weights in there and getting it all souped up. Um, and then we'll do the same with the primary by replacing the helix in the spring. So um, I'll go get all this ready and we'll pick up back on the workbench. But before we do that, like I mentioned, good time to kind of get in there and uh, inspect everything. If there's any like visible, like fresh kind of oily residue or oil leaking out here, you need to replace those seals. Mine seem good, which, is, which I'm really happy about. Check everything here, make sure the tapers are nice and clean. Uh, we can clean off all these surfaces here, make sure everything's nice. We can give, um, I like to give the, uh, the belt housing a good wipe down. I like to clean the back portion out. I always like to clean the inside of the belt cover as well. Make sure it's all spotless. That way when I put it back on after the service, I know that everything's clean inside and then any debris that I find in there, next time I inspect it, I know that it happened after the last service. So it gives you a good idea of like, is there a leak? Uh, you know, like if, if you damage something, then you know it happened after the last time you had it off. This is actually a really good time actually for me here to address the fact that I really wanna do a, a exhaust snorkel, like a CVT exhaust snorkel on this thing. So I'm gonna see if I can come up with a way to maybe extend that CVT exhaust and put it up a little higher because it's a really, it's a weakness of this machine. You get water splashing up in there and then it wets the belt and your belt slips when you get like, basically you can only go this deep in the Razor Turbo because then the water starts to pull back in through the top of the CVT. And this area here, these these seals, the clutches, they're not supposed to get wet or contaminated. Um, like the, the bearing that's in the primary clutch, which I'll show you at, on the table that we're gonna inspect, it's not designed to, um, it's not designed to hold water or debris out. It's just an open needle bearing. There's no seals on it or anything. So if you contaminate this with, with muddy, dirty water, you pretty much have to replace that bearing. It's gonna destroy it. It's gonna really cut back on the life. I replaced mine last season and it hasn't really seen any abuse since then. Uh, so it should be good. But anyways, we'll shift over to the bench and we'll take it from there. Okay, so we got both the clutches out of the machine, the primary and the secondary. And um, now we can take them apart. The secondary slides apart really easy. There's three grooves here, and you can see a lot of debris from just wear and tear on the clutch and the belt and stuff like that. You got your sheaves on both sides, and then there's wear components in here that we'll be replacing, and I'll show you what they look like once they've worn out. 
Uh, these ones are like, they're not super worn out, but they're definitely let ready to be replaced. So on this one, you can actually see um, there's a little bit of wear on the actual clutch itself. It's worn into the uh, aluminum there. I don't know how well it's picking up on the camera. It's not bad though. I'm, I'm not too concerned about it. Um, it should be fine. I'm not going to replace the secondary. That's expensive. Um, it's definitely not anywhere as bad as it. It's not bad enough that I need to worry about replacing it right now. So there's just three Torx bolts holding these in. So we'll set that aside for now. On this side, if you flip it over, there's three Torx bolts here. And those are holding in the secondary spring as well as the helix in there and a couple more wear components in there that the helix slides up and down on. So we will address those as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our secondary clutch compression tool to squish this together when we undo these and then we can let it off, take the old helix out, replace the wear items and replace the secondary spring as well. For the primary, we don't really have to worry about a compression tool. The tension in here isn't bad. It's enough that you just hold down with your hand and undo these 10 millimeter bolts. Um, there's six of them. And then you can lift this cover off and get access to everything in there. And we're gonna switch out the weights. We're gonna switch out the primary spring. We're gonna replace this cover plate with the one that's got the fan blades built in. And we're gonna inspect and replace all the wear components on this clutch as well. Here you see the snap ring delete kit from Boondocker. It's slightly different setup than the one from Aftermarket Assassins, but they're both very similar. I had it set up where um, the belt deflection in my mind was, was pretty good, but I like the um, Aftermarket Assassins setup better. Plus I'm gonna be running all their components just to keep things, um, keep things kind of in line. Um, that way we know everything will work in synchrony with each other. The only thing I'll be keeping from Boondocker is I'll be utilizing their stainless steel super sliders in here. So here we have the, um, it's like a hard kind of fiber reinforced type of plastic. I don't know what the exact material is, um, but these are um, gonna be replaced through the wear items inside the primary clutch there. So we'll replace all three of these. The sliders from the factory aren't made of like a high-end stainless. They're made of more like a tin and they wear through. These ones still look good. I've had them on for a season. We're gonna utilize those still. For the secondary, we're gonna replace all these. And you can see there's like kind of there's kind of like where the grooves in them. Basically, like once you've worn through those, it probably means you're ready to replace them. I don't see any grooves on um, the ones that are in there that I replaced last season. So they're definitely ready to be replaced. We'll compare the new to the old uh, once we get those apart. Aftermarket Assassins markets these as like heavy duty clutch components. So I'm hoping they're made out of a slightly more resilient type of material and maybe we'll get a little bit more life out of them and these are numbered one two three actually which is interesting so that's cool um, these are also for the secondary this is what the helix rides in speaking of the helix here's the 1024 helix from uh, aftermarket assassins they offer a couple different helix designs i think it most differences in the the taper and the angle on the helix itself um, this is supposed to give you much better clutch um, action on like my type of riding style. They've got different setups and they explain um, the pros and cons of them on the website. So um, yeah, we will install the 1024 Helix into the secondary. We will install this fan blade primary clutch cover on there. Cool. I got to mention that um, the um, instructions that come with all the aftermarket assassin stuff is pretty good. They all have nice pictures and um, and they look good. The, so yeah, it mounts up like this. So the instructions all look pretty straightforward, which is nice. And um, it just goes over the key points. I read through all of them and they all, um, they're all very straightforward. Oh, this one's got stickers on it. Mine doesn't have stickers on it. What the heck? Stickers have power. Duh. So we've got the primary spring here. 
light blue and yellow. And then we've got the secondary dark blue and orange. You can see the size difference in those. So this is the secondary and this is the primary. And here we've got the, um, the adjustable weight sets. And um, here are the weights. So you have these three small ones that you can like go in the first hole there, I guess. And then there's three sets of holes there and you can adjust the weights on that online and in the instructions that they send with you. They have a pretty clear description of a, a good starting point based on like your tune, your performance, your turbo setup, as well as your tire size. Um, so we're going to start off with the recommended aftermarket assassin setup out of the box and then um, like most things it might take a fine bit of fine tuning like removing or adding a weight and basically what they want you to do is get it set up the best you can out of the box and then road test it run it up and down the road check the rpm and stuff like that and uh, dial it in so that it's perfect and in the right rpm gauge uh, range you got three of those and the weights these are like magnet weights. They're kind of like, they're like earth magnets. They're very strong uh, once they're in there. Um, there's a hole, a small hole on the other side and then that hole is so you can push them out because there's no way of getting them out once you put them in unless you push them out. You always have to make sure you get them in there flat and, and perfect so that they're sitting flush and even with each other. Here's some hardware, some extended length hardware or is it? Yeah, it's just, anyways, it's just different hardware that they send you to utilize with this, um, with this fan cover. So here we have the clutch compression tool, which I'll be utilizing for the um, the secondary clutch. It's, it's literally just a piece of threaded rod, two nuts and two washers. It's not expensive from our aftermarket assassins or you can make your own. I've got, um, I've got one that I made on my own a while back years ago for um, my first ATV. And I've also got a universal one that I, I picked up from uh, Royal Distributing, but I figured I'd, you know, I'll grab this from them. It was, it was literally not much more than the cost of just getting these materials. So um, I picked that up and it's always nice to have options. And that's something you can slap in your toolkit and take with you on longer rides when you're going away and stuff. And here you've got the snap ring delete kit with the different washer stacks that we'll use for the secondary to set the belt um, deflection. <laughs> So yeah, that's about it. That's the overview of the parts. We will dig into um, getting these clutches redone now, which should be pretty straightforward. We can start off with the secondary. It'll likely be a little bit easier to do. Uh, so why not start off with the easy one? So um, when we're doing this, we'll also do a good job cleaning all these clutches. And since we'll have the clutches apart, it's a really good time to to uh, clean the um, the contact surfaces here uh, and scotch pad them really nicely. You can run your hand across them. Make sure that there's no waves in them. Make sure there's no deep grooves in them. Take a look at it. If you're seeing like a really like visible rainbow pattern here, then it's likely this clutch has overheated. Um, if you're seeing like weird wear or deep grooves, then there's something going on, something's worn. You wanna see a nice, even kind of wear pattern. Um, and basically this is a little too smooth. So we're gonna scotch pad it all to create a nice biting surface for that new belt to break into and um, a nice friction surface so that the belt grabs really nicely. Go around your clutch, make sure there's no cracks. Sometimes these can crack if they've been overheated. My clutches look pretty good. I don't see any damage on them. I don't see any cracking. I don't feel any really pronounced ridges. Every time you change the belt, you should run some scotch pads in there. You don't wanna to go too deep, obviously, just like a nice green scotch pad and just run a cross hatch in there so that the new belt has a nice uh, fresh service to mate to. But yeah, uh, the visual inspection on these looks good. I don't see any cracking, deformation, anything along those lines. So I'm happy. So we can take these out and then we'll proceed to put the compression tool on here and then remove the secondary, replace the helix and the wear items and, um, and put it back together. So we just need a T25 Torx to unscrew these guys. And we'll remove them and take a look at them. When we put these back together, we're going to put a little dab of blue Loctite on there just to make sure they don't back out. That's the last thing we want happening. Before we reassemble this, we're going to do a good job cleaning all these surfaces. 
we will sand down the, the clutch surface and we'll clean all the dust off it, the debris off it, so it's nice and clean when we reassemble it all. Now we can look at these. Yep, this one is definitely quite worn. It is ready to be replaced. Could it keep going? For sure. Is it adding to the noise that I'm hearing? Most likely. It's adding to, it, 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 all this adds friction too. I mean, I don't know how well you can see the wear on this. You can see it's a, there's a good groove in there, a wear pattern. This side's not as bad. Eventually, the secondary clutch probably needs to be replaced as well. But if you replace these as often as you should, and it's very easy as you can see, then um, it will prolong the life of your entire clutch setup. Oh yeah, this one's quite warm. That's definitely ready to be replaced. I, I bet you can see the ridge on that one. Yep. Yeah, there's a good, good half millimeter to almost a millimeter in the edge here. But this side is perfectly fine. Nowhere. So if something's not running right there. I mean, that helix might be, might be not the greatest either. So um, we'll see how things wear with the new clutch. So, oh yeah, that one's quite worn too. You can probably see that ridge there too. Yeah, similar wear to the other one. And then once again, the other side has no wear at all. And I'm guessing that might be due to the rotational forces um, of the machine usually going forwards, not reverse. And the direction of spin is probably putting pressure and wear on one side of the, um, the pucks more than the other side. Because, I mean, even when you are in reverse, you're not in reverse for a long time and you're not going lightning fast for extended periods. So that's all off. We can go ahead and clean this, like I said, and we can scotch pad this side up here. So I'll do that first. So I've got a scotch pad here. And we'll just go around and we'll do this whole surface. Actually, that one's a little, I need a newer one. I've got a nice newer one here. I, I, you should actually be using like a green scotch pad probably, but this gray one should be good enough. Aluminum's, aluminum's a soft material. We just want to take the glaze off there really. Work a nice crosshatch into there. And just go even all around. Don't need to go in one area too long. Don't need to go too deep either. Just expose that nice fresh aluminum surface. You obviously don't want to go at this with like a 30 grit sandpaper because you're going to cause a lot of damage. Once you feel you've um, got all the glaze off there, then uh, you're ready to clean this guy. I look like, looks like I got a decent cross hatch on there. Got rid of the glaze. I, I feel like I should use a, maybe a little bit of a rougher pad, so I'm gonna grab one. Managed to find a piece of a new brown scotch pad or like a dark yellow brown, muddy kind of color. This is a, a step harsher than uh, your typical green scotch pad. So you don't have to be too, too forceful with this. I'm just gonna go around. Yeah, now I'm seeing a nice cross hatch pattern. I'm gonna go around quickly and just add a little bit more, more texture to this kinda. That's looking better. Just change the angle of approach as you're doing this. You don't wanna run circles around it like that because the belt's spinning like that. You want the scratches to kind of be going like this on straight lines so that they contact the belt and actually add a little bit more friction there. So go one way a bit, then go another way. But don't go around in a circle like this. And don't go crazy like I said. Okay, that's looking really good now. I'm happy with that. <clears throat> that's all you need. <clears throat> I don't know how well you can see it on, on camera, but you just need a light kind of scratch pattern on there. And that'll give you a nice mating surface for the belt. We'll set that aside. And uh, before we start reassembling everything, we will clean it all nicely. 
now we can move on and we can go ahead and do this one. Okay, <clears throat> so we got a nice cross hatch on there now too, on the other part of the secondary. Everything looks good. Now we can go ahead and take this one apart with the compressor tool and replace the wear items, the helix and the spring. So we'll take the compressor tool apart here. Like that, one side through here. Through the other side. And then just put our nut on. Center it on there. Doesn't have to be perfect, just get it close. It's a three quarter inch or a 19 mil. So I'll put a 19 mil on one side and a three quarter on the other. And then just snug that guy up, not super tight or anything. And we'll go ahead and undo these torques. These are a T30 torques and just loosen them up evenly. Be careful because you definitely don't want to damage these. You don't want to strip them in there. And there's one. Nice and straight with the torque so you don't strip it. Two, three, there we go. The spring compressor is, um, it's holding all the tension anyways. That's the whole point so it's not on the bolts. So now we can go ahead and start relieving pressure on the compression tool here. And you'll see that it starts separating here. We're getting a gap now between the surfaces there. You can see the helix has come out and you can see the spring in there. Once you feel there's no pressure left on there, you can just loosen it off the rest of the way. This is relaxed now. Now I can take that nut off. No more pressure there. And just pay attention to the way it's all positioned in there because you're gonna put it all back together the same way you took it apart. All this stuff is pretty easy. You just gotta think about it, put your head into it. None of this stuff is rocket science. So we're gonna be replacing all these goodies in here. So I'm gonna lift them out as an assembly like this. This is the secondary spring I had in here. And uh, when you compare it lengthwise even to the new one, there's quite a difference there, isn't there? This is an aftermarket spring from Boondocker, like I mentioned earlier in the video. I think this part is replaceable too. It's like a brass shim or something like that, a washer. In hindsight, maybe I should have replaced that. Next time I'm in here, I will do so. Here we have some more wear items. These guys right here. And um, yeah, these ones actually look pretty good still. They're not too worn, but obviously I'm gonna replace them. I'm putting new components in, but we'll, we'll set those aside. We'll keep them as part of this OEM kit. These guys are T25s just like the other ones. So we'll loosen those. So you can see here, there is some wear on these. This surface here is flattened off, whereas these ones are completely rounded. So there is a bit of wear on these. These ones are numbered one, two, three from aftermarket assassins. I, I, I really don't know why. I don't know if maybe it's for reference for later. They all look identical. Maybe one of you guys know why they're numbered one, two, three. So uh, you can fill me in. We'll inspect this clutch too everywhere here. Make sure there's no issues. This one's worn as well. Probably see the, the wear ridges there. 
This one's got some wear in the same spot too. So we'll replace it with the nice new ones. So this is all apart. We'll just go ahead and clean this in a minute. Let's set that guy aside. Now let's take a look at our helix here. So we have the, I don't know what you call this thing, but basically the part that holds it all together. Then we've got the helix, which is holy cow, way different than the one we're putting in. So yeah, these helix, this helix looks way different. So these ones are like numbered or something. Uh, C1, C2, C3. I don't know what the heck that means. There's some definite like glazing on this helix. I wouldn't call it like real wear, but you can see the contact patch. You can see it hasn't been contacting evenly everywhere on all surfaces here. There's some kind of surface corrosion in a few spots. So yeah, this helix is also much heavier, much different design. This one almost looks cast and then machined. Actually, this one looks like it was cast too and then machined. Significantly different. Cool. And then we've got the secondary shim here. So this guy's going to basically go into there and it supposedly just makes everything operate smoother, smooth as butter. So we'll take the new spring. We'll slap this guy in there. We'll slap our helix on top, just like that. And then this will go on there. And then our butter washer will go on the bottom like that. So basically I'll just go ahead. I'll clean up both these clutches quickly. You can just go ahead and use some brake clean. I got some CRC brake clean here. It'll make easy work of these pieces and get them looking good as new. Get all the debris off there. Also get rid of any grease or uh, contaminants on the belt mating surfaces. So let's get these babies cleaned up. So we'll just use some CRC brake cleaner on here. Get these surfaces all cleaned up. Just get rid of some of that dust and grime in there. Stuff makes easy work of it. Pre-soaked this one here a little bit. Nice and clean. Let those guys dry off. Looking spotless, good as new. Let them dry and then uh, we can reassemble them. Reassembly is easy. It's just the opposite of disassembly. So now we'll screw these guys back in. There's a C right there. So I'm gonna put the number three right there. These are a nice tight fit. They actually like push on. The ones I took off weren't like that. Yeah, that's nice. They like click right in there. Then we're gonna put our bolts back in. I'm gonna quickly hit them with the wire wheel just to get that old Loctite off. And then we'll put a bit of blue Loctite on there and slam them in. Okay, I wire brushed all the hardware. Ah. Now I'm gonna put some blue Loctite on there and get these guys back in there. You don't need to over torque these. They're just little fasteners. Don't go crazy on them. Just snug them in there nicely and the Loctite will do its job. Hold them from moving. Make sure they're all flush and mounted in there like they should be. They all look good. And snug them up. Those all feel good. Now we'll take our butter washer, put it in the bottom. 
We'll take our secondary spring. We'll take our spring retainer washer. We'll take our helix and we'll take the cover plate. And then we're gonna put the compression tool on there again. Washer and get the nuts started. And then you can push it down and start tightening it. Get it centered. And basically we're gonna we're gonna tighten it until it mates up with the bottom there like it's supposed to the base. Once you get closer, you can line the helix up so it slips in there properly. But it should position itself, really. Move these guys around so they're lined up. And keep tightening till it goes flush there and snugs itself up. Once you've snugged it up and lined up all the holes you can get the hardware started also going to put some blue loctite on there and just finger tight to start make sure you get it all started nicely you don't want to cross thread these or you're in a whirl of hurt just take your time getting it all lined up nicely Start them by hand, and then you can tighten up the compression tool all the way till it's tight down. It's bottomed out now, so we can go ahead and tighten these guys. And now we'll hand tighten them with the hand ratchet, just to not tweak anything. This helix, this aftermarket helix seems to also uh, stick out more here than the other one did. Don't go crazy with these, hardened metal going into aluminum. Don't want to strip those threads. Let the Loctite do its job. Okay, that's pretty much done. We're just going to back this um, compression tool out now and inspect it and make sure it's all good. And then we're going to put in the shims here. All right, the clutch compression tool is out. Everything looks lined up. The helix looks lined up. Everything bolted down nicely. And it looks like it should. So now we'll move on to the last piece here and we'll slip these new guys on there and tighten them up as well and then we can reassemble the secondary and move on to the primary rebuild okay the last step of the secondary repair or um, rebuild would be to slip these guys on here like that they're a nice tight fit too they slide on there nice and tight and then we're gonna put the screws back in, or the bolts back in. We're gonna clean the old Loctite off with a wire brush. We're gonna put a little bit of blue Loctite on there and tighten them down. Just like I said earlier, not too tight. Um, you don't wanna overdo these. Let the Loctite do its job. These go in pretty light, just kinda screwdriver type. Get your T25, a little bit of Loctite, and get these guys in there. Make sure you start them lightly so you don't cross thread them you don't want to cross thread these and i'll say it again do not over torque these just snug them up there we go we're gonna give these clutches a final wipe down with some brake clean or some acetone before we put it all back together and get it on the machine just so there's no contaminants on there 
Those are on nice and tight. Now we can reassemble the clutches. Now you can take your clutch, you can slide it on there. There we go. We are done the secondary rebuild. Piece of cake, wasn't it? Pretty easy. We've upgraded this secondary with all the aftermarket assassins goodies. We'll set this guy aside. And then we can move on to the primary next. Now we'll work our way through disassembling this one and reassembling it with all the upgraded components. Hope you're having a good time following along. I hope I don't miss anything. I'm going pretty slow. I'm just covering the basics, not going into too much detail. Pretty straightforward job on both of them. So um, definitely something you can easily do at home. Don't need too many special tools or anything like that. So let's dig into the primary here. Make sure you like, subscribe to the channel and follow us on Instagram and on Facebook too if you enjoy these videos and share them with your friends. So we're gonna take off these 610 mil bolts here. So you gotta put pressure on this guy. You can see I can push down the spring here with my hands. So as long as I put a bit of pressure on there like that and hold the spring down, I should be able to take this off without using a spring compressor. My arm is a spring compressor. And that's off. You've heard it drop there. So we'll set this whole piece aside here. So we will still be utilizing this piece, but our fan cover is gonna go over top of it. And that's why they've supplied us with some longer hardware to mount that on there. It's basically gonna go on top through here. So just to keep things together, let's pull all these out. And then basically this is gonna sit on there like that. And see these act as fan blades to move more air in the CVT case. Cool basic idea, really neat. So now that we've got that off, we can go ahead and remove all this stuff. This is an OEM primary spring. This is the aftermarket assassin spring. Looks a little different. That one sits in there too. So we're gonna install the weights. We're gonna install all new wear item, all new wear components. Um, we're also going to install um, the limiter washer. This is the primary clutch limiter washer that we'll be putting on. As you see, it's got a, a groove in there. This is the factory limiter washer. It doesn't really have that groove. It's got a bit of a lip, but this one's got a lip and a groove, and it's also a little bit thicker. Um, and what it does is it protects the clutch from overshifting. That leads to a bunch of different issues. Um, so you'll see the spring fits right in there in the groove. It also helps keep that spring nice and centered. So basically it just goes on like that and then you reassemble like you normally would. So we'll set that aside and we're gonna take apart the rest of the clutch here now and um, see what we're working with. So I replaced these um, the OEM sliders that are made out of like tin with uh, the boondocker ones, they're super sliders. They're made out of like a heavier duty, kind of like a stainless steel by the looks of it. And um, they seem to be holding together quite well. There's a little bit of wear on them, but not much. Uh, the ones I took out last time were quite worn. And these ones all look pretty good. I'm just gonna lay them out where I take them out. Yeah, they all look pretty good. A little bit of scuffing, but no no ridges or anything like that. And I'm just gonna wipe down the, the super sliders and stick them back in there. Also a good time to inspect your bearing inside the clutch. You wanna make sure that guy's rotating nicely or that's gonna lead to belt wear as well. I replaced this one last year. It does sound a little noisy. Truth is I should probably replace it again, but I don't have a new one. The clutch is easy enough to pull apart, so I'll probably order a new one from the uh, dealership and I will replace that as well in the next little while. But for now, this will be good. Okay guys, so we replaced the last part of the clutches. The last wear item is these pucks here that slide onto all three of these corners. 
and um, I had to go to the dealership. There's a special spider socket or whatever you call it that they use to take this off. It's like a, it's got like these steps in it. You can buy this socket from Polaris or probably from another parts distributor or a tool distributor. Um, I don't have one, I'm gonna have to get one. But um, this is torqued on to like 300 foot pounds or something crazy. So you need like a, a tool to hold the, um, the bottom of the, the clutch by these kind of fins so it doesn't spin. And then you gotta take that guy off. You pull this off and then you can replace these pucks. And um, you can probably see here, there's quite a bit of wear on these pucks. There's only about one season on these. There's not that much use on them, actually. Uh, you, hopefully you can see it in the video. There's some significant wear there. And you can see that it's more worn here than there. And um, they all kind of seem to be worn more on one side. Um, the truth of the matter is I've got some actual wear on the aluminum portions of these clutches or of this clutch, and that's probably causing an increased wear in these. Um, but from my understanding, I can't just replace this section, the triangle section of the clutch, because it's balanced with the rest of the clutch, um, or that's what they told me at the dealership. So technically I'd have to get a whole clutch assembly. So for this season, I think I'll get another year, at least out of this clutch setup. And if I decide to keep the razor longer, then I will, um, I'll probably just get a new primary clutch. The secondary is fine. And um, I'll just deal with it that way. There you can see the wear. So yeah, make sure you replace these components. If you've got a decent relationship with your dealership, it literally takes them 30 seconds, maybe a minute to take that off. Then you can slap these guys on you and then put it back on. Uh, I just swung by the dealership at Grand River Power Sports in Brantford, Ontario here, and they did it for me for free. Um, they hooked me up. They look after me pretty well there. That's where I bought my last couple of machines. They're my most local dealership. You guys have probably heard me talk about them before. I've been dealing with them for a while. Um, and yeah, they're, they're only about 15 minutes away and they do a good job looking after me. So that's always a benefit to have a good relationship with your local dealer in case you are in a bind or something like that. I'm reusing the Boondocker Super Sliders instead of utilizing the stock sliders. I'll show you a stock slider. This is a stock slider versus the Boondocker Super Sliders. They look kind of similar. So yeah, these are the OEM ones. They've got some decent wear in them. Like I can feel lips and grooves in there. Um, I can't feel that on any of these. They're smooth. There's a bit of like kind of like a there's kind of like a bit of a haze here from the aluminum and the pucks riding up and down. So I'm just gonna spray some WD-40 on there and get a, get a light duty scotch pad and just, it's not really, this scotch pad's not hard enough to really scratch the stainless steel these are made out of, but it'll take off all that surface layer and give me a nice clean shiny surface for my new, um, my new pucks to ride on. You can just see, it just cleans it up. There's still a little bit of discoloration there, but there's no actual pitting. There's no ridges. My finger can't really feel anything on there. So these are still good. I'm gonna reuse them. And we'll just do that to the other ones there as well. And then I'll slide these guys in there in a second once they're clean. Here, I've already got one cleaned up. You can see it's in there. All right, so now that all these are clean, we can go ahead and slide them in. It's pretty easy to do. You just literally get that guy and slide him between there. The stock sliders go in similarly. They just slide in there as well. Just make sure they bottom out so everything's flush here so that when you put your cover plate on, nothing binds. And we'll get this guy in there. Like that, make sure it's flush. And it is. Perfect. So that's it. Those stay in there like that. Now that that's all in there, we can go ahead and we can put our spring on. And then our washer goes on there. And then we can put the cover plates on. But before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna install the weights. 
So what we got to do is we got to take the nuts off here. And those hold the stock non-adjustable weights. And we're going to pull those out. And we're going to replace them with our adjustable weights. The magnetic ones we showed you earlier. And we're going to set it up according to the instructions. They give you a good breakdown here on like which helix you're using and um, which level tune you have as well as what your tire size is. So they have like 30 to 32 inch paddles, 20 to 29 inch paddles, 31 to 32 inch tires, 29 to 30 inch tires. And then they have the recommendations on what to set it as. And then they list the peak RPM at 55 miles an hour. S3 kit with performance 1024 Helix. And then I'll be running a level two or three tune or an aftermarket assassins water cooled turbo level two. So I've got a level two or three and I'm gonna be running 32 inch tires. So I'm gonna set my weights up 4320. That's what they recommend starting at. And my RPM at 55 miles an hour should be between 84 and 8600. So now we can read through the instructions here and it'll tell us basically how to set up the weights and which hole is what. So magnet hole one on the setup sheets is closest to where the pin goes through. So that's the pin and that's magnet hole one, two, three, four. Man, these weights are strong. All right, so now we're gonna look at our sheet here, just to double check, four, three, two. Four in the number one, three in the number two, and then two in the number three, nothing in number four. So four, three, two, zero. So we're gonna take four of the big guys. These washer, these uh, magnets are so damn strong. And you wanna make sure you get them in nice and even so that they sink down to the bottom flush and they're sitting straight. So that's four. That's nice and in there. Three. Oh, this one cracked. See that? They're really brittle. Be careful. So I'm gonna take that damaged one. There's extra weights in here anyways. I'm gonna take that damaged one and set it aside. So I'll get three. So four, three. Push it down, make sure it's flush. Check the back, make sure it's bottomed out, it is. Three, and then we'll do two. We got two, and then push it down. Make sure it's bottomed out, it is. And then zero, four, three, two, zero. Boom, that's done. That's my weight stack. And that's gonna be what we start off with to test. We might have to add or remove weights and we'll deal with that once we get the machine up and going and we, um, we can run it through the um, RPM range like they suggest. So we'll set that guy aside and we'll load up the other ones the exact same way. Four, three, two, zero. Now make sure you don't follow exactly what I tell you because depending on the tire setup you've got, obviously you're gonna have to follow the chart and set it up like they recommend. Four, three, two, zero. 31 to 32s on a stage two or three tune. So I'll do the last one now and then we'll go ahead and we'll remove the bolts to get the old weights out. So it says here, each magnet weighs approximately 1.4 grams and shows roughly a 100 to 150 RPM change. Base clutch arms are 58 grams. All three clutch arms must be set up identical to each other for proper balance. Less weights, less magnets will result in a higher peak RPM, while more weight, as in more magnets, will result in a lower peak RPM. Our clutch guidelines work very well, but not every machine is the same and not all tires weigh the same. This is why checking your peak RPM after installation is extremely important. If possible, we like to run on a paved road and do a few quick tests with a plastic clutch cover off, do a 10 mile, per hour to 60 mile per hour wide open throttle run. When you pass 55 to 60, glance at your RPM gauge to make sure it's within the chart specs below. So now we're gonna remove these um, bolts here. So there's a 10 mil nut on one side 
and then an Allen head on the other side. These aren't on there too tight, so just make sure you get your Allen head in there good so you don't strip anything. And when you pull these off, that'll let you get the um, stock non-adjustable weight out. There we go. There's the bolt that the weight rides on, pivots on. And then the weight comes out like that. So we'll remove all three of those. We'll set them aside and then we'll put our new weights in. So I'm just gonna wipe this down. It's got a little bit of surface corrosion on it. Just a little bit of WD-40 on a scotch pad. Make sure it's nice and clean, nice and smooth, so the new weights don't bind up on anything. And give it a little wipe. Okay, that guy's ready. We can now put our new weight on there. So there's only one way to really put this in. I'll just lay the clutch over, we'll slide the weight in there. There we go, that guy's in there now. And we can get our nut on. These are like a, a cool lock nut, but I am gonna put just a tiny little dab of blue Loctite on there when I go to torque them up. But right now I'm just gonna leave it loose. I'm just gonna start it. So I can keep the nuts and the bolts together the same way I took them apart. Okay, so we'll dab some blue like tight on there before we tighten that all up. Just a little bit, just to be extra safe. This baby spins really quick. And we'll go around and we'll do the same thing. We will get our Allen head in. Our socket. And we'll loosen this guy up. And we'll take that out the same way. And we'll go around and do all three of them like we just did and put the new weights in. So you can see there, the old weights in there. And then the new ones the same way. New ones in there now. And you can just see on the new one, we've got those, um, adjustable weight holes. And then you can get to these weights without removing them. You can kind of poke a punch in there or a pick and you can push out the weights or add more. It's a little harder with its in, but it, it should be pretty easy regardless. You just got to kind of get your fingers in there and jiggle it around. So yeah, I'm going to get those other two in. Okay. I've got all three of those guys in there now. I'm just going to put a little dab of blue Loctite onto the nut on the threaded portion of the where the nut goes on there not a lot just a little tiny dab just enough to kind of make sure it's secure in there and then i'll torque them down these don't go super tight they're really small fasteners you don't want to mess them up so use your head when you torque these you're going to let the lock tight and the lock washer do its job Okay, snugged up there. That should be tight enough. That guy's on there good. And these these um, pins do move a little bit. Even when they're torqued down, it bottoms out. And you don't want any of this stuff binding, so there is a little bit of movement in it, and it'll balance itself out when the machine is running and the clutches are spinning. So everything's working fine there. Perfect. So we'll go around and do the same thing to the other two. 
Okay, all three of those are in, all the weights are in, everything's torqued, everything's Loctite, everything looks good. If you haven't blown your clutches out yet, if you got some compressed air, now's a good time to just get all the dust out of the clutches, blow them all out so they're nice and clean for uh, when you get everything reassembled. So I'm just gonna get some compressed air and I'm gonna blow out all the dust out of the clutch now. Okay, so I blew out all the dust, everything's good to go, everything's torqued down. So the last thing we do is we're gonna slip our sliders in whether or not you're using stock sliders or these super sliders or something else, just make sure that they're flush here so that nothing binds. Once we got our sliders in, we can put a primary spring in. This is the blue and yellow one from Aftermarket Assassins. We have their limiter the spring limiter, the clutch limiter, with a groove for the spring to ride on, centers the spring nicely. And then once that's on, we put on our plate. And we'll have to compress it down. And we're also gonna put our fan on. And we're gonna use the supplied hardware from Aftermarket Assassins to hold that fan on. These bolts are a little longer than the sock ones to make up for the thickness of the fan. So position your fan blade on here if you're using it. If you're not using a fan blade, then you're gonna utilize your stock bolts. So to get the primary together, you don't actually need a compression tool. It's pretty easy to do it without. You can just lift this up like that. Get the bolts to kind of fall into the holes and then slowly start finger tightening them, you'll feel they will, like some of them will grab easier. Once it grabs a bit, just go on to like another one and get it started a little bit, a couple threads, and then go around and do this for all of them until they're all started a few threads and everything lines itself up. You don't want to cross thread any of these holes. You want to be really careful. And then once you got them all kind of finger tight, you can go around and torque them down a bit more and then just go evenly so that it snugs it all up without causing any damage, right? Make sure all your sliders, I got the slider caught here, so that's a good example actually. You wanna make sure your sliders are all, you don't wanna get anything caught in there. I just accidentally got that one jammed up in there. So just got to get these out. So pay attention to that. You don't want to crank it down with the slider under there and bend it or damage it or get it jammed up in there. So I'm going to go around and loosen these. I know in previous videos, people said it's cool that when I do work on this stuff, if I do make a mistake, I don't cut it out. Um, what I just did there, I mean, that's not really a big mistake, but it's an easy mistake to make. That's why it's important to go around and make sure you're doing everything bit by bit, not rushing anything, not using an impact gun on this stuff because you can damage these sliders, right? And you don't want to damage any of these pieces. You want to make sure they're all sitting flush under where they need to be. You'll see this one's stuck under there. This one is too. You want these sliders to be on the the outside of this plate. So I'm going to loosen this guy up too. There we go. Now I can get the slider out on this side of the plate. Not underneath it, so it's getting crushed. So all three of them are outside the plate now. And I can go ahead and I can start tightening these down bit by bit. Take your time. You really don't want to screw something up here. And once you've done it a few times to get it's easier. I've already rebuilt this clutch before. And then you'll feel it pulling down the spring and compressing itself. Just go around nicely, tighten all these bit by bit. It's really important to get them started straight so you don't cross thread them. And then just work your way around and tighten them down bit by bit. 
making sure the sliders are lining up right. This cover plate holds the sliders in uh, over this area. So you don't have to worry about those guys coming out or anything like that once this cover plate is on. Positions those sliders where they need to be. Once you've got a good start on all this stuff, you can get your ratchet on. You can go ahead and start finishing them off, but focus on going down evenly. Just so everything is nice and flush and even on, on all, all the sides. These clutches are expensive, so you don't want to damage anything on them. And they're balanced and sensitive, right? So you want to make sure everything's like it should be. Go around, make sure your washer's even. Everything's good there. Looks good to me. Now we can finish snugging it up. I like to go in a star pattern. I'm not sure what the specific torque spec on these is. I kind of use my built-in torque wrench. I know the size of the fastener. I know that it's a hardened steel fastener going into aluminum, so you want to be careful. There's a lot of thread engagement on these. They're long bolts, so they're going to hold well. Don't overdo it. Last thing you want is to over torque them, not be able to get them out or have them strip or break or something like that. So those all feel good to me. We got our fan blade on there. The clutch is moving nicely. That new spring feels nice and firm, firmer than the other one. All our sliders look like they're in the exact place they need to be. They're in there secure and good. Yep, everything looks and feels well. The last step for this clutch is gonna be the same thing we did to the secondary. We're gonna scotch pad the inside of it here, and then we're gonna wipe it down with acetone. I don't like spraying down the, um, the primary clutch with brake clean because it'll get into the bearing. And these bearings aren't sealed, it's just a needle bearing rotating in there. They're not designed to get exposed to the elements or, or dirt or water or anything like that. If you submerged your, cl your clutches and you fill your belt case with water, you should replace that bearing realistically. Um, it might still work if you get them wet and you dry them out right away, but it will impact the bearing life. So make sure you keep an eye on that. I should be replacing this bearing. It does sound a little noisy, but I did replace it last season, so it's probably still fine. The one I took out originally was well worn, but it still had some life left in it, so I'm pretty confident this one will be good. Next time I get into these clutches, I'll replace that bearing. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna wipe this down with a clean rag, and then I'm gonna scotch pad it. So I'm gonna go wash my hands, get all the grease off it. I'm gonna rub this down with some, some acetone or brake cleaner on a rag, and then I'm gonna scotch pad it like a nice cross hatch pattern like I did with the secondary and then we'll be ready to go to the machine and install these clutches back on the razor. So I'm hoping you're enjoying this video. I'm hoping I didn't really leave anything out. I'm not going into too, too much detail, but I'm trying to go step by step. Anyone can do this. You saw the tools I need, nothing too fancy. The most um, advanced tool you need is, is just like a clutch compressor, which you can really make at home on your own with some threaded rod, washers and nuts. And then you need the special socket for here, which you can either buy or head over to your dealership and get them to help you out with that. So um, yeah, that's it. Um, so follow along. If you, don't, if you don't understand something, leave a comment. If you've if you got any questions, leave a comment. Um, if you're looking to get these components from Aftermarket Assassins, give them a call, shoot them an email. Uh, Mike's really helpful if you email him. Sometimes it takes him a few days to get back, but he, he will get back to you and he'll give you the feedback that you need. So I'm gonna get this all done and we'll get a little scotch pad and we'll get it back on the machine. Thanks for watching guys. Like always, thumbs up, thumbs up. Thumbs up really helps the videos and the channel grow. Uh, it really helps us rank in the YouTube algorithm. YouTube likes to see the engagement and the thumbs up. They like to see comments and subscriptions. So smash that subscribe button as well. Really appreciate it. So I'm just wiping the clutch surfaces down with some brake cleaner now on a paper towel so I don't dig this grease into the clutches when I'm cross hatching them with the scotch pad. They're quite glazed from the belt. 
remember to inspect this. I've got a little bit of scratch marks on the very bottom near the bearing from the belt just riding there when the machine's at idle and stuff. But generally speaking, the clutch surfaces look really good. So we'll get our scotch pad and we'll go ahead and we'll scuff up this surface like we did on the previous clutch. So just go around and do a nice even job all the way around on both sides. Remember to go up and down on them. It's better than going like this, but it's okay to switch up the pattern, get all that glaze off there, give that belt a nice roughed up surface to bed into and grip onto. So I'll do that and then we can go get the, we'll wipe it down one more time and then we can get the clutches on the machine. Okay, we got a nice cross hatch on there now. Scuffed up, got rid of all the glaze on both sides. I'm gonna give it the final wipe down and then I'm just gonna clean the grease out from in that main hole there from uh, using the clutch puller and then it's good to go on the machine. Okay, that those clutches are clean. We'll wipe out the rest of the grease inside there. Get as much of that grease out as you can. Okay, that's pretty clean now. Now we're gonna go take these over to the machine and we're gonna get them ready to mount. I'm gonna give a quick wipe down to the secondary as well, just to make sure there's no debris or residue or anything like that in there, no grease. See, there's still a bunch of crap in there. There we go, that should be good enough. And we'll take these over to the machine. So you can see that there's some dirt or some grime and debris there. I'm just gonna spray that down with some WD-40 and I'm gonna give that a good wipe down. I like to clean all those surfaces before I put the clutches back on. Uh, I like to clean the belt cover before I put the, the belt cover back on because it lets me know that next time I go in here, if I leave this all spotless and clean, I'll know that all the debris, all the oil, if it starts to leak, if there's, if there's some sort of contamination there, I'll know that it happened from the moment I finished the service until the next time I took it off. It's not gonna be like, this dirt's not gonna still be on there. So I'm gonna know any new accumulation happened after I did this service. So it's a good idea to kind of just, I, I like to do that. And it gives me a good idea of whether it's been contaminated or whether if there's a seepage around the seals, whether that's a new thing or, or, or an old thing. So I'm just gonna loosen some of this debris up with a scotch pad so it's easier to wipe. This isn't an abrasive one. It's just like a light duty scotch pad. As you can see, doing this clutch work is quite easy. You just kind of got to take your time and you've never done it before, work your way through it. It's not very complicated. Anyone can do this. And all the aftermarket components, especially like when you buy quality aftermarket components, they all come with really good um, instructions and a breakdown. And the cool thing about it is too, you can reach out to these companies. They offer good customer service. That's part of what you're paying for, the R&D, the customer service, the fact that they've tested tons of these kits on thousands of machines. And also a lot of people are running these setups on similar machines to yours. So you can go online on the forums, on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can look up what's working for people, what kind of issues they run into, and then all sorts of feedback on setups and, and different brands and different uh, weights and different helix setups for the type of riding and performance that you want to get out of your machine so um, It's good to stick to the bigger brands because they have that backing of um, Like you can get information you can talk to people about what they've done. So that's all cool At least I hold quite a bit of weight Towards that stuff too. I feel that um, it's good to I've said this many times in my videos that you should be supporting brands that give back to the industry, that provide quality components that are manufactured in, you know, North America, for example, or even in Europe or wherever, but manufactured to, with standards in mind, with uh, the end user in mind, not just bottom line profits. Um, a lot of the guys that are running these, these businesses, like Aftermarket Assassins, just as an example, because that's what we're dealing with now, like these guys are passionate about this industry. They love it. They don't want, they want to see it grow and, and develop. 
and they want to provide products they're proud of. Um, so there's no snake oil here. Uh, they're giving you a good product. So keep that in mind. It's worth spending the extra few bucks sometimes to get what you pay for. So this is pretty, pretty clean now. I'm happy with that. I'm just going to wipe it down again and then we can go ahead and we can start to reassemble and reinstall the clutches and torque them down. Clean off this ceiling ring here. This is where your seal and your belt case go together. Make sure there's no built up degree there. Oftentimes people put grease on the belt casing, especially if you've got a used machine. You might notice that I've got some debris and some, there's some belt debris here as well as a bit of grease residue because I like to put a little bit of grease around the OEM seal. So a good way to break up that grease is just to hit it with more WD and just spend some extra time and get this all nice and clean so it's perfect. You ride hard, you gotta maintain your machine appropriately. It's like if you're a granny and you drive your Toyota Corolla to get groceries five miles one way, once a week you put 10 miles on your car, then that Camry is not even gonna need ball joints for 20 years or brakes or anything probably. But if you take a car out on the racetrack, for example, you're gonna have to service the brakes and the ball joints and, and the other wear components a lot more often. When you ride your razor down rail bed all the time and you just take it easy and you're 50 percenter and you're just out for a Sunday cruise, which there's nothing wrong with and you're not hardcore, then you're gonna get a lot of life out of a belt. You're gonna get a lot of life out of clutches. You're gonna get a lot of life out of ball joints and brakes and all that stuff, suspension components. But if you're a racer or if you go out and you, you think you're gonna kill hills all day and you're gonna bounce that thing like a rock bouncer, then <laughs> you better get ready to tear that thing down after every weekend and make sure everything's okay and service it and maintain it. Um, these are all, all these things wear out and they wear out depending on how you use them. So I'm sick of hearing people online say, oh, this is garbage or Polaris is garbage or Can-Am is garbage. Well, do you know what you're doing? Do you know how you're maintaining your machine? Like, are you putting the time into it that you need to? Are you trying to save $10 and buying cheap parts, aftermarket garbage? Or are you putting the parts you need on it to keep it running at factory or better condition? Ask yourself those questions before you complain. A lot of you guys will say this is overkill. It's just the way I do it. I'm OCD when it comes to this stuff. So how I like to do, this is what makes me happy. It lets me know my machine's okay. This is how I discover problems. Good way to find issues. And uh, that's what I like to do. I know a lot of the other guys out there are probably very similar in the way that you meticulously maintain your machine and you don't want anyone else touching it. You don't trust the dealer. You don't trust certain shops. You want to do it yourself. Uh, it's part of the ownership process to me. Can't say it's the funnest part of owning a machine, but I don't really mind it. It lets me know when I'm out on the trail next time that everything's A-OK. -okay. And if I hear a noise, I know what it is or I know what to look at. Okay, that's all done. Let's slap those clutches on there. Oh yeah. All right, so we got our primary. Slide that puppy on there. Get our big bolt, pop it in there. Get it started by hand till it's in there good. And we'll torque that guy on there. We'll hit it with the impact gun in a minute. There's mixed opinions on whether you should impact these or not. I leave, your, I leave the decision up to you guys. Not gonna get into that debate. Okay, so we got the, the bolt in the primary, just finger tight for now, and then we'll get our secondary on. The last thing we'll need to do with the secondary as well is put the snap ring delete kit on it. Okay, so we're gonna slide, make sure that's clean. We're gonna slide the secondary on. On the spline shaft. Sometimes it takes a few shots to get it to, to get in there. There we go. That's on there. Now since we're using the snap ring delete kit, you're going to grab your OEM bolt. You're going to grab the small hold washer. You're gonna grab two of the thicker shims to start. That's what they recommend starting with. And then you're gonna grab your factory washer with the little hole in it. 
and then those are gonna go on there. So you'll see these ones ride over. And then that goes like that. And this gets torqued down to 40 foot-pounds. It's a 15 mil. There's 40 foot-pounds. A little extra. Now we'll torque down the primary. The primary is a 21 and it goes good and tight. That's in there good. This impact gun, by the way, isn't ridiculously strong. It's one reason I like it. You don't want to take your half inch five, six hundred dollar Milwaukee and do that. You're probably going to snap something. This thing will not snap like a wheel bolt. It, it's great for these types of applications. So that's on there nice and tight and we can mount our new belt. But before we mount the new belt, we're going to wash it in warm water with soap. So let's go do that. So here we've got our striker belt by G-Boost from Aftermarket Assassins. A lot of people will tell you that you should wash your belts with dish soap and warm water and scrub them down with a brush or a little scotch pad on the sides. Some people say use a wire brush. Usually I just wash them with soap and water and I just scuff the sides up a little bit with a scotch pad. Um, and this is supposed to get rid of any of the residue from manufacturing these belts um, so that it bites really nice and you have nice fresh clean rubber exposed when you break in that belt. So we'll go ahead and just use some dish soap on a scrub brush. Nothing fancy here. Let's get it all nice and clean. Now I've heard people online say that some belts are directional. I know certain belts will have an air on them and be directional. I've heard others say that it doesn't matter which direction you put these belts on, but if you take it off, you should remount it in the same direction. And then I've heard other people say it really doesn't matter at all. So I don't know what kind of school of thought you guys follow, but it would be cool to hear what you think or what you know and what kind of facts you have to back it up because it's a debate that's been started many times on some of my videos that have to do with like changing a belt or something like that. So it'd be interesting to see what you guys think or know or have heard or have done in the past. Mostly I think it's these surfaces you have to worry about, the tapered edge of the belt. That's where most of the gripping happens in the clutch sheaths. So I just hit it with a scotch pad a little bit. I don't go crazy on it or anything. I just want to take any glaze off it from the factory or from shipping or whatever, or release agents they might use. Now remember guys, it is really important to actually properly heat cycle and break in your belts. You wanna belt, bed the belt correctly into the new clutch um, surface and uh, you wanna heat cycle this belt properly. Um, generally what I do and what I've been doing and I've had good luck with on both these types of G-Boost aftermarket belts as well as OEM belts and many machines in the past, whether it's side-by-sides or ATVs, is um, I'll run it without holding it wide open and just kind of give it 40 to 50%, run it in various RPM ranges on the road, for example, or on some gravel or in a backfield, just, um, you know, mildly let it warm up really nice cycle it from like 20 miles an hour to 50 60 accelerate but not too hard and then um, let it warm up park it for an hour let it cool off do it again let it park it let it cool off and then go do like a third ride that's a little more spirited warm that belt up even more if you've got an infrared belt temp gauge then get that belt nice and warm don't get into the red zone but get it well into like the yellow and then um, sit it again and let it let it cool off naturally before you drive it and that usually does a good job extending the belt life. So I'm gonna dry this off with some compressed air and then we'll get it mounted. All right, so we got this nice clean belt now. I dried it off, it's nice and dry. And um, we'll get the clutch 
spreader tool from the toolbox the OE, or the toolkit, the OEM toolkit, to thread in here and spread those clutches open so we can get the belt on. And uh, we'll get this guy on there and then we'll get the case on too. Okay, we'll get our L-shaped clutch compression tool or clutch spreader tool actually. And um, I've seen people online using like one of the bolts out of their, um, like their fenders or stuff like that. You'll notice that this tool has like a, a, a blunt end on it. Um, a lot of the bolts that hold your plastics on, even though they're the same thread pitch, have a self-tapping kind of end. They will damage the contact surface behind the clutch. If you're in a bind on the trail and that's all you have, then yeah, go ahead, use it. But if you've got the proper tool, just use the proper tool. Go buy yourself a spare one of these at the dealership if you need to. I think they're like 10 bucks, which is quite a bit for just a piece of threaded rod. But um, at the same time, you kind of need this. So having an extra one around the shop in case you lose yours on the trail isn't a bad idea. Make sure you thread this in there properly and it's going in nicely. If you feel resistance, don't force it. You could bend the thread tool, damage the threads, um, or you could bend the tool or damage the threads or break it in there and then you're in for a world of hurt especially if you're on the trail so there we go you can't go any further because um, it hits the, the bolt here but it should be good enough so I'm gonna mount mine so I can easily orientate it with the so I can read it like this made in Japan G boost it's all like that we will make this the direction of mounting and if we pull it off, we'll try to put it back on in the same direction. But I've run them in different directions and they've been fine. So put it on your primary first, slide it on the bottom and through the top. And once it's on the primary, you can slide it onto the secondary by just rotating the secondary and it'll pull it right on there. Just like that. And then just unthread this guy and you're pretty much good to fire up your machine. We've torqued both the main bolts. Everything else on the clutches is replaced. All the wear components are replaced. And yeah, so we'll keep the case off for now, like the case cover, because I want to run it like this. We'll check the, we'll check the uh, backlash on the belt. So we'll check the, um, the deflection, I mean, and we'll see how everything is. Right now it's just kind of sitting touching everything because the belt's on there, everything's new. Uh, it's the, the clutches aren't like tightened up or anything, but uh, we'll see how the belt sits in the um, secondary once we fired it up. And then um, we'll be able to uh, get an idea of whether or not we need to adjust the shim stack on the secondary here or whether it is good. So yeah, pretty easy. That's the worst of it done. Now the rest is fine tuning. And as you guys know, that's often the most important part. We're gonna dial in the weights for our tire setup and um, we're gonna dial in the belt deflection and make sure everything's good. We'll run it for a bit. Um, I don't wanna really do the full out 55 mile an hour pulls yet on this brand new belt. So what I'm probably actually gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of drive it around and heat cycle the belt a little bit, make sure everything's okay with the clutches and they're functioning well before I beat the piss out of it. Uh, it'll be nice to get those clutches moving a little bit too and let them wear in all the new components before we really we really hammer on it. So um, that's what we'll do. I'll probably just do a few, um, I'll just do like a road cruise, uh, but we'll fire it up in a, in a few minutes and we'll show you the how the clutches move and make sure everything's okay and um, get you guys a cool shot because the clutches look really neat when they're spinning. So yeah, um, that's that. Uh, the last thing we're gonna do is put the belt cover on once all that's done and put all the plumbing back on, but that's easy. You guys know how to do that. I mean. The, the majority of it is done now. Like I said, it's all fine tuning. I'm just gonna fire it up and make sure everything's okay. Seems okay. Definitely sounds a little different than it did, but it's always louder with the cover off. The belt looks like it's riding up pretty high nicely. Shift her into gear now and see how she does.
yeah, so I think it looks like everything's okay. The secondary's riding flush. Like the belt's flush up to the top, so that's pretty good. The secondary's not spinning when um, it's in neutral. Like you, it spins up when you rev it, but then it stops. And then the one way, or the, uh, the bearing on the primary is spinning. So the belt's not moving, so that's a good thing. I hate, I think my throttle body's messed up because it, it doesn't cycle on and off. Does anyone else's razor do that? I, maybe I should get it warranted. I don't know. It's coming from the throttle body. Yep, everything's looking good. I'm stoked. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna work on some other stuff I gotta do now and then we can road test it once the shocks are back in and stuff. So we'll pick up there once the machine's more assembled and then we'll be putting the tune on as well. Sweet, so the clutches seem like they're working all right. Everything's good. The secondary is not spinning in neutral. It's not spinning when it's in park or low or high gear when it's not moving. When you rev it up, the secondary starts to spin. As soon as you let off and the RPMs drop, it goes back to just sitting still and the belt is just spinning on the bearing inside the primary like it should while the primary spins. So that's good. It seems like the belt deflection is good right now. That belt is riding right in the top of the, um, the clutch there in the secondary. So that's really good. Um, so yeah, pretty stoked. Um, sounds like everything's okay. Looks like everything's okay. Everything went together well, no issues at all. Really nice quality components from Aftermarket Assassins. That belt's on there. So uh, now we'll get the rest of the razor together. Hopefully we can get out for a trail ride this weekend, but I really need to get it out and break in that belt before we trail ride and make sure everything's okay. So uh, I'm gonna focus on um, on getting the shocks back on. I'm gonna finish wiring up my rock lights and stuff like that. So the last thing left to do is install the tune. We're gonna install a stage three tune from Aftermarket Assassins. It's on the DinoJet tuner, so um, that should be pretty easy to do. So we'll show you that in an upcoming video, um, just cause this one's already getting pretty long. We'll just keep this one to the clutches and then we will um, we'll do the tune in the next one. And then we'll also do some, uh, we'll do some drag pulls and some, and some testing and some fine tuning um, in the upcoming video as well, but we'll, we'll, stop, we'll close up this video here just as a basic clutch removal, uh, service, rebuild, and reinstallation, um, and that should cover all the bases. Whether you're using the aftermarket Assassin's goodies, whether you're just rebuilding your stock clutches to stock specs, or whether you're using a competitor's product, um, these video, this video should apply to that pretty much any razor and pretty much really any CVT is going to follow the same basic concepts here minus maybe a few different bolt sizes or placements or locations things might look a little different but the general function will be identical but um, if you've got a Polaris then, then this should apply to you um, and I'm assuming like I said quite a few other vehicles as well so I hope you enjoyed the video leave it a thumbs up that really helps the videos rank better it helps people discover them on YouTube it helps our channel grow uh, it really helps uh, the YouTube algorithm pick up our videos and share them with more people that may have not seen them yet. Uh, make sure you subscribe. I got tons of people watching the videos, but a lot of you guys aren't subscribing. I see return viewers. I even see people leaving comments over and over on videos watching them all, but you're not subscribed because it shows me all that in the analytics. So if you haven't subscribed yet, then please smash that subscribe button. That also helps out. Follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. And also check out the Shopify store because we're going to have some cool swag on there. We're going to be adding some cool new stickers and we're going to work on some new shirt designs. It's just, um, it takes time guys. I, I'm, I'm pretty much, um, most of the time I'm a one man show here. So I, I got to film this, I got to do all the work, I got to edit it. So it does take time. So thanks for being patient. Check out the, the upcoming videos. There's going to be lots of good content coming your way. Also check out some of the previous do-it-yourself videos as well as our awesome trailer riding content. So we'll see you in the next video. Ride safe out there. Big shout out to Aftermarket Assassins for hooking me up with these goodies. Uh, they give me a really good deal on these parts. Full disclaimer, we'll be giving you an update on these parts in upcoming videos. Um, I did pay for these parts. They gave me a bit of a discount, but, um, but they didn't send me these for free. So we're gonna do a, a full out realistic review. We're gonna see how they hold together. We're gonna see how they work. We're gonna see how we like them. And we're gonna see how they act in the real world on the trails and stuff. So stay tuned. We'll be giving you updates on, this pro on these products in, uh, in future videos. On trail riding videos we'll bring it up we'll talk about it and you guys will probably be able to see the difference as well um, so yeah stay tuned lots of great content coming your way i'm done